Uh, good afternoon. I'm Rob Manal. I'm a member of Fauntleroy United Church of Christ in West Seattle. Uh, thank you for uh, joining us for the third of three seminars, which we've called Exercise Your Power, Elections, Public Policy, and Lobbying. This series came about as a result of my frustration leading up to the last general election. In a couple of conversations, I voiced my concerns to Fauntleroy Church's senior pastor, Leah Atkinson Belinsky. She politely said, more or less, well, what are you going to do about it? A couple of weeks later, I proposed three themes, election security, how public policy is made, and the value of the work of lobbyists. Pastor Leah and Associate Pastor Karen Fraser and the church's Christian Education Committee all felt that some learning on these topics could serve to build trust or faith in our democratic form of government. And further, this information could be helpful when talking with anyone who considers their voice is not being heard. April 16th, uh, we talked with Dr. Nahid Aftab a King County elections official. She gave me great confidence that our mail-in voting system is absolutely secure. Last Sunday, we heard from retired West Seattle resident Eileen Cody, who served in the state legislature for 28 years and chaired the House Health Care Committee. She talked about the origins, considerations, and strategies in creating and passing legislation. This afternoon's seminar is Quote, lobbyist is not a four-letter word, end quote. <laughs> <laughs> I, I will draw on my 19 legislative sessions as a member of the Washington State Hospital Association lobbying team. And my portion will be followed by commentary from Susie Tracy, who is trying to retire <laughs> after 43 years as a contract lobbyist. Oh. Uh, before that, there are a few housekeeping details uh, David Wells uh, will function as the host, admitting audience members. Uh, two, we invite you to add your names to your screens and remain muted. In the second half uh, uh, of this, we will do some questions and answers, um, perhaps extensively. As questions come up to you, uh, you can write them down in the chat function or uh, in the lower part of your Zoom screen, or just uh, keep them in mind and directly ask them when we get to the Q&A session. Uh, for we are recording this session and we'll post it later on the church's YouTube account. The first two seminars have been posted and they've been visited by a few people. Uh, finally, our goal here is understanding, not debate, We'll assume goodwill and respect for our guest as well as the group. Thank you for attending today. And Carolyn, would you put up the first slide, please? So to begin with, uh, why did I choose this title? Probably 25 years ago uh, or so, the hospital engineers professional group across the state invited me to uh, come to their meeting and talk a little bit about lobbying. Um, probably they had connotations that were negative about the term lobbyist, and that's how I came up with this term, because I don't think it is a four-letter word, and I think it has great lobbyists have great value. Um, next slide, please. There are a couple of questions I want you to think about, and we'll come back to them towards the end. The first question is, how many lobbyists represent you in Olympia? If you are a member of a health club, if you are a member of AAA, if you are a member of AARP, if you are a member of a church or were or are a member of a union, um, you have a lobbyist in Olympia. So I imagine that just about every one of you said, yeah, I guess I did have somebody representing me. I probably just didn't know about it. Let's go on to the next slide. The second question is, 
what would happen if we had no lobbyists? And I will come back to that at the end. Next uh, slide, please. Representative Cody last week set this up pretty well. Uh, she answered a question from Dennis Eaton and said, and I paraphrase, lobbyist, honestly educate and inform. And I hope you will agree with that statement before we're through here. Let's go on to the next slide. I'm loosely categorizing lobbyist functions in two buckets. One is to protect and advance the interest of the, the lobbyist client or clients. And the second is to function as a graphite or, and or meshing the gears of the legislature to make something happen or perhaps not happen. And now I will elaborate. Let's go on to the next slide, please. I further separated this into two sections. One is dealing with uh, what happens when the legislature is in session. Um, and the other is what happens in the bulk of the year when the legislature is not in session. And this is known as the interim. Uh, it's important for lobbyists to study the issues um, so that they are better informed in preparation for the next legislative session. So this could be done through a formal process. Of, sometimes the state legislature will create a commission to study an issue anticipating uh, some controversy and um, that it will come up again in the next session. Uh, also the hospital association where I worked, we did our own research and studies from time to time and produced internal papers that would guide us. Um, and then other times it's more spontaneous, um, especially if a topic comes up just before the legislative session starts and you don't have enough time to do uh, a lot of research, um, you got to kind of wing it. Part of the preparation or studying and uh, learning about the uh, topics is to know who to contact, what experts are out there that you can reach that will give you a straightforward, understandable, technical, uh, factual uh, uh, advice. Uh, the example I frequently use is the laboratory uh, professionals in the state of Washington. Uh, like most of the other staff in the hospital association, I was a generalist. Uh, I didn't have technical expertise in practically anything, but I had a, probably 30 or 40 people in various categories of, of employment around hospitals that I could call uh, and get good advice. Um, in the interim, we also spend a lot of time communicating in both directions with our members so that they are aware of what direction a piece of legislation is going or we're seeking feedback from those members. We also would be engaged from time to time in follow-up activities. Uh, let's say a piece of legislation required hospitals to implement something. Um, from time to time, we would do a survey or call people and say, how are you doing in meeting those requirements? We're also involved in campaign activities. The hospital association, association had a PAC. Um, I think it was about three hundred dollars or $400,000 that was available uh, on a two-year cycle. And occasionally, we would uh, volunteer as by participants in campaign activities directly, like doorbelling. Um, we did this for a few legislators, ones that we really depended on and thought would be uh, allies or had been allies in the past. And then uh, last in the interim, we are again communicating with legislators, the leaders of the uh, caucuses, the uh, uh, leaders of the most important committees to us and uh, possible uh, sponsors of legislation. And more importantly, even we are encourage the hospitals to, the hospital CEOs primarily, to invite legislators to lunch, take them, bring them to the hospital, serve them a meal, and then give them a tour around the hospital so they have a better idea of what's uh, happening in the hospital and it's more complicated than what they would see walking through the lobby or going upstairs to see a, a patient uh, in a patient room. Now, during the session, uh, obviously, the, one of the most uh, obvious things is uh, test of testimony before uh, legislative committees. Um, this is 
the most visible, um, and it's not always easy. Um, I say that because sometimes legislators will ask questions that are just beyond my knowing or our knowing. And other times they ask questions that are so confused that there's no easy answer. Um, sometimes it's helped to have an expert accompany uh, the lobbyist uh, so that when the technical questions come, I can say, would you answer that question, please? And again, I'd use a laboratory specialist as a, as a good example. Physical therapist might be another uh, example of someone we could call on when needed. Um, we would ask members to make calls. Probably today, these more likely would be text messages uh, to legislators uh, uh, at critical times. Uh, people who are on a committee, we want to encourage them to vote for or against a piece of legislation. Um, we would be, of course, informing legislators and the committee staff of where our members are on a piece of legislation. Uh, and as things evolve during the session, we would have to uh, update the legislators and if the hospital association position changed. And then last, we would, uh, of course, help pass or improve or kill pieces of legislation. Go to the next. Um, now, I use the term graphite, um, it works for me. Um, and by that, I mean, we try to keep things moving if we're, we're trying to get a piece of legislation passed. So we would be in regular contact with the uh, leaders of the uh, uh, legislature with the committee chairs and the sponsors of bills. Uh, so they know how we're progressing. Um, we would also be working to schedule bills for hearings um, or votes both in the committee and uh, rules committee and uh, house and senate floors. And as part of that process, we would be counting votes. There are some legislators uh, who would be sponsoring a piece of legislation that would absolutely insist that it not be brought up for a vote unless there are enough positive votes for it to be passed out of committee or on the floor of the house or the senate. So one of the lobbyist functions is to count votes actually talking to legislators and making notes about who's going to be for or against and then reporting that back to the key legislator. Uh, the next slide, please. The graphite for me also means uh, generating ideas that would work towards a solution. And um, this frequently is accomplished in uh, floating conversations that would go uh, in sort of a circular fashion lobbyist, uh, legislator, committee member, hospital representative, technical representative, and then back around as we're sharing ideas and trying to establish uh, a consensus on what will work. In fact, one of the definitions of legislature, legislation is the art of the possible. So we're trying to establish what is possible. And that can include drafting language uh, so if uh, a bill looks like it uh, could pass, but there are a paragraph or a sentence or two uh, that someone objects to or could be improved, the uh, lobbyists can spend time, and sometimes this has to be done in just a matter of hours, drafting language that would be offered as an alternative to achieve uh, a solution. And these conversations happen in lobbies. And I think that's where the term lobbyist may have come from. What's next? Next, next slide. So from time to time, a lobbyist is challenged to kill a piece of legislation. In fact, one of my longtime lobbyist friends stated he didn't care if a piece of legislation ever passed that favored his employer. But he wanted to be very sure that no negative bills were ever passed, the ones that would hurt his employer. So he thought killing bills was one of his perhaps most important uh, responsibilities. So it, it, some of the same things would happen, except maybe in a negative fashion. We would contact uh, leaders in the legislature, uh, sponsors of legislation, and tell them where we are. Um, and. We could try to prevent a bill being scheduled for a hearing or for a vote. 
Uh, we would count votes to provide uh, a head count on what the likely outcome of a piece of legislation would be. Uh, and we would do this by generating honest doubt. Um, I want to assert that at least uh, in the hospital association and most of the medical area lobbyists that we work with, um, I've never heard anybody state anything dishonest. Um, I might not be able to say that about a lobbyist, perhaps who represented uh, uh, tobacco companies or maybe uh, big oil. I won't name any names. Um, and why we're making that consideration of whether we want to try to kill a bill or not, we've got to weigh the political advantages or disadvantages of doing that. And an example might be, if we have a legislator who sponsors a bill we want to kill, but that legislator also sponsored some legislation that we liked, we'd have to weigh the advantages and disadvantages of whether we really wanted to kill that piece of legislation or not. Um, as an aside here, just uh, uh, I didn't make a, a slide for this. The advocacy budget for the State Hospital Association when I worked there was about 25% of the total budget. Um, now, that meant for uh, contract lobbyists and the staff lobbyists and the time that they put in during the legislative session um, and also the amount of money that we uh, spent uh, 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 contributing to campaigns. So uh, 25 to 20, 27, maybe even 30% of the budget was for advocacy. That's what the hospital association uh, is designed to accomplish. Let's go on. So the first question was, uh, how many lobbyists represent you in Olympia? Um, my answer to this is I think it's probably more than you thought it was. Um, again, I gave you some examples. If you had one, two, or three of those, then you are well represented uh, in Olympia. Uh, next slide. Question number two was, uh, what would we do if we didn't have lobbyists? And my answer to that is we would probably grow them spontaneously. Uh, I believe they are necessary, uh, particularly in uh, a democracy. I'm familiar with the British Columbia Hospital Association and the Hospital Association represents the state of Victoria in Australia. And they both have lobbyists doing the same kind of work that we did in, in Washington state. Um, I would propose that even in an authoritarian government, there are probably lobbyists. They might not be called that, but I think every special interest group probably has somebody looking out for their interest in the uh, authority, uh, the, the decision-making office um, in, in an authoritarian government. Second, I would say the legislature uh, uh, would become even more staff dependent. And I think this would be a problem because the staff's constituency is other is the legislators. Uh, it's not the people back home who would be affected by uh, legislation. Not that they don't listen to the people back home, but they're really beholden to the people who run the legislature or their immediate boss. And I think the result would be poor quality legislation would be uh, less informed, uh, less factual based, probably more emotionally based and of a, a, a poor quality outcome. So that concludes my uh, formal presentation. And um, I'd like to next uh, introduce uh, Susie Tracy. Um, it's my pleasure to introduce Susie. She's uh, cut her teeth legislatively as an aide to the esteemed Idaho Senator, the late Frank Church. She moved to Olympia in 1980 and represented uh, at first the Washington PUD Association for about two years. And let me explain a little bit. I was an employee of the State Hospital Association and I lobbied only for that group. There are government agencies, this is a second type uh, of, of lobbyist, there are government agencies, uh, local and state level, uh, like King County um, or the Department of Ecology, for example, who have lobbyists. In contrast, a contract lobbyist, which is what Susie Tracy is, 
are is self-employed and will have several clients at the same time. And Olympia, Susie's clients included the Washington State Medical Association, the Washington Academy of uh, Eye Physicians and Surgeons, the Washington Poison Center, and the Washington State Arts Alliance, and a number of others. Susie and I have been allies on many topics over um, probably 30, 35 years. Uh, for example, the state trauma system and uh, the funding of the state poison center. And we've been on occasion opponents, uh, which I won't bring up specifically. Uh, and Susie told me a few days ago that she is finishing one of her most challenging legislative sessions. So to begin this next segment, I'm gonna ask Susie a couple of questions to uh, get the conversation started and then we will open it up to everybody else. Um, and at this point, I think we can still manage that by people uh, re uh, raising their hand with a little graphic that says I'd like to talk and we'll pick you up one at a time. Um, so my first question is uh, for Susie is, over your career as a lobbyist, what have you seen that have been the biggest changes in the legislature? Well, that's a great question. And I would just like to preface my answer. Um, I appreciated the introduction, particularly the part having to do with Senator Frank Church, because that is how I got going. But I noticed, Rebecca, I, when he said Frank Church's name, you put a smile on your face. And that could mean all sorts of things. But uh, <laughs> those, those six years of working for Frank Church put a smile on my face a lot, because he truly did, whether you agreed with him politically or not, um, he really truly did represent his district, which is at the heart of what I think Rob and I want to communicate a lot of today. But he knew everyone's name. He knew their grandchildren. He knew what they did when they were growing up. Um, it was all personal. And so everything that I think that Rob has told you builds on what I think he and I would like to communicate today, that it's all about relationships, whether you're an elected official, a lobbyist, someone who cares about an issue in, in a district. Um, it's all about relationships. Some of those can be good. Some of them can be bad. So what has changed on the basis of what I just said? First of all, there are a ton more lobbyists than there used to be when I started in 1980. If you've been to the Capitol building, you know that there's large floors, marble, and you could easily fit a group of lobbyists on the stairs going from the third floor to the second floor. Now, I, you'd fill up the whole, all the stairs, many, many. Lots of people have contract lobbyists, lots of people have agency lobbyists, local government lobbyists, and certainly many association lobbyists. So I've seen a lot of that change. I would also say that when I began, I had no idea that I'd be one of three women who was a lobbyist. Really, truly, there were three women lobbyists. And now I would say that there's easily over 50%, I would say, are female lobbyists. And I don't think that that was intentional. I think it just happened. There were more people who became active in government, jobs outside the home, et cetera. And I think the other thing, and we can talk about this more in some issues if you'd like, is partisanship. I I, I was probably naive. I worked for a Democrat senator in, in Idaho. I really never knew how strongly people could feel about their their party versus their issues. And when I began I think it, you know, there was partisanship. I can't say there was not. I'm not sure I was smart enough to recognize it, but so much of what we see now is partisan. And an issue that I'd love to talk about if we have a chance before this is over is an issue that should not have been partisan and has become that way and how frustrating that can be. And the takeaway from that is the, the absolute need for public participation. And with that in mind, Rob, I just want to add one, one thing to your question is all of you are lobbyists. You may not be paid. There are plenty of lobbyists in Olympia who aren't paid. But I think if you look at yourself as not just somebody in the 34th district but or whatever district you're from, but as you, you truly are an advocate, you really are a lobbyist. And we paid lobbyists really can't get our jobs done as well as we'd like without that individual district-wide 
issue-wide lobbying. So whatever you're doing with that now, just keep it up and know how important it is. And I'm going to say one more thing, Rob, and I know you haven't have other questions, is I do talk for a living and I know I can go on and on because I love talking. So just put your hand up and say, enough, next question. Um, because I, I'll talk your ear off for the next couple hours about lobbying if you want. So, so Rob, I'll right now. another question is, uh, how do you, how does a person become a lobbyist? Who, who are lobbyists? Do you have to be an attorney, for example? Absolutely. You do not need to be an attorney. Some people will tell you that you do. Um, I am not an attorney. I don't play one on TV, even TVW. Um, but I, I, I can't say how many people have said, well, it, you know, if I were an attorney or I need to go to law school to be able to be a lobbyist, I would bet 10 times in 43 years, I really said, gee, I really need to talk to an attorney and see what that really means or find a way to fix it. So you do not need to be an attorney, nor do you need to know anything about the issue that you're talking about. So, <laughs> I, I mean, truly. So when I was hired by the PUD Association um, back in 1980, I will say that the reason I was moving from Idaho to Seattle was that Frank Church was unelected and I needed a job. Um, so I decided to move to Seattle. I knew no one in Seattle. I didn't even know of any jobs in Seattle, but I had worked for Senator Church with a lot of federal agencies. So I had names of people who worked in Seattle. And I just started going through those names and saying, oh, you know, do you know of any jobs? And ultimately one said, oh yeah, the PUD Association is looking for a lobbyist. I had no idea what a PUD Association was, but they flew me over, we talked, um, they'd closed the applicant process. And I said, well, I still want the job. And by the time I'd flown back to Idaho, I had the job. Um, that isn't to say I knew anything about a PUD. I had no idea what they were. I didn't know that they had a nuclear power system that was involved. Um, I moved over here. I didn't even know that Olympia was an hour south of Seattle. <laughs> I will say that of everything in all my years of lobbying, learning new things is my very favorite part. I I can tell you a lot about public and private energy now. Um, I could I learned it very quickly because I had to. Um, so I think. I mean, any of you can go to Olympia and be a lobbyist. You may not be paid, but um, it's, I just, I, I, the learning, I mean, it, Rob mentioned a few of my clients, there've been many and they've been across all kinds of issues and all kinds of committees, but I have to quickly learn and I have to know where to look for information. I have to share that information sort of effectively. And I, I think that's the very best part. You all come with specific information, knowledge, you know, but when I'm hired by a theater in Seattle, that doesn't know, mean I know a thing about how theaters are managed or what their budgets look like. So it's learning and I, that's my favorite part. Yeah, yeah. To, could I go back to the first question a little bit? One of the things that's changed is the number of female legislators. Can you speak about how that may have changed how things work in Olympia? or don't work? Well, I think they basically do work. Um, I think they bring a different perspective. Um, I'm not sure that the policies change. It may be the way policies developed. I, I think often the women legislators listen to you more carefully. Um, I, I think they certainly bring a perspective about child rearing, daycare, you know, things that well, I don't want to generalize I, that men are bad about that because many of them aren't. But I, you know, there's, I, I don't think it makes a big difference, but I think over half the legislature now is female. And it certainly, it, it has changed things, but I'm not sure for worse or better. It's just a slightly different feel. Okay. What's the Public Disclosure Commission? Okay. Um, in, just before I was hired here, the Public Disclosure Commission was basically started by initiatives to the legislature to develop a way of making transparent not only what campaign money is given, which I think was one of the early desires um, of the public to see where the money was coming from and how it was spent, but also how much a lobbyist is paid, you know, how much entertaining they do. 
So every month I'm required to file a document with a public disclosure commission for every client that I work for, what I'm paid, what I've spent on entertainment, um, or in that case, what my client has spent because it seldom is my own money. Um, and any campaign contributions, I might've been responsible for sending or um, handing out. Um, I don't walk around with big bags of money and give them out of the doors and never have to report it. All of that is totally, nor do I give out a lot of money for my clients as it turns out. But all of that's reported to the PDC and you as the public, uh, I will say it's a very complicated website, unfortunately. But you can go in and look at my name and see what I'm paid and see what my can, my clients have given for money. I think it's a tremendously important system. Uh, I won't say that there's not some hiding of of information, but by and large, I think it's really straightforward, really important. And can I just throw one issue in here that I mean has nothing to do with what of I like? But you may have noticed on your ballot that you're asked periodically to reaffirm or not affirm a tax decision that the legislature might have initiated the session before. So do you do you agree with this tax or you disagree? And there's a little explanation of it. And, you know, I kind of, I mean, I answer those, but I've never really paid much attention to how important they might be. But the legislature this year decided that the public really, you know, they, Legislature is not bound by what you what you say your opinion is on on those ballot um, and issues, so they're they're taking that away, and there was a you know so that you don't have to answer those questions. Um, that was really heavily debated on the floor of both the Senate and the House. Uh, well, we don't we're not obligated by that vote. Yes, but we should know about them. It should be a conversation process. So even though the PDC has been around for many many years, it's still you know, subject to some manipulation and some different ways of approaching transparency. But I think anything you can do that's transparent is really important. Uh, so one more question. How do you get a, a legislator to pay attention to you? <laughs> I would say that's now maybe the hardest job, Rob. It's certainly different since you've been there. Um, let's backtrack to COVID. Um, before COVID, if you picture the third floor, the marble halls in the Capitol building, um, during certain parts of the legislative session, there's a whole bunch of us who stand outside those doors and we write notes to people inside and say, Eileen Cody, come out and talk to me. And she'll come out and talk to you or not. Um, that's an easy way of communicating. You know, during committee hearings, we testify all the things that Rob mentioned. But during COVID, all of that went away. The legislators weren't here. We weren't up at the Capitol building. So we had to reinvent not only how we communicated, but how all of you had to communicate as well. So everything was virtual. Um, everything was on Zoom. Every meeting I had with legislators was on Zoom. And maybe the most important thing was that you as the public actually got to punch a little button on your computer and sign in pro or con on a piece of legislation. So those people who lived you know, six hours away in Spokane actually could testify, um, they could sign in. I just thought it was absolutely wonderful how it opened up the communication process. So it wasn't a bunch of lobbyists standing at the door or you know, tripping people in the halls or whatever you perceive we might do. It was real live communication. I think it was wonderful. I mean, people, there might be 2000 people signing in on a particular piece of legislation. <laughs> Did it really make a huge difference in how in the outcome of that vote? I don't know, not huge, but I think it really gave the public <clears throat> the feeling that they were participants, that they were lobbyists, like we started out saying. Um, I, I would say now, I mean, I, I was not on the Hill a lot this session, um, still used Zoom calls because I found that they actually work. Um, it was a lot more time efficient to, to participate that way. But you know, there's a lot of legislators, and if you need to talk to 50 of them, it's really hard to get all that information out. There's a lot of emailing at midnight. There's a lot of, you know, texting, um, hoping you run into somebody in the halls. So, I mean, I think any way, again, it's sort of like the transparency, any way that we can do it, any ways of communicating. But 
um, it can get frustrating. And I, I bet Rob has another question that might address that. Well, I think I'll go on uh, and we'll open this up. Uh, there's a couple of questions in the chat function. One is from David Wells. The question is, have you ever lobbied for an issue that you personally disagreed with? I am asked that question every time I make a presentation. I have been asked to do that, but I've never done it. Um, I, I, I mean, usually when you have a new client or somebody's interviewing you, you're there because you kind of have an interest in that public area. Very seldom are you tripped up by, oh, I didn't know this is what you wanted. Um, but it's happened a couple times that it was just a little problematic for me. And I just said simply, hey, if you want me to work for you, um, you have to take that issue off the list. Never have asked anybody to put more issues on the list. But I, I, I don't know how you sincerely look a legislator in the face and say, I want this when in fact you don't want it and you can't do it from your heart. So I've been very lucky. I've picked clients where the issues are passions of mine or I really wanted to learn and it was not controversial. Um, that isn't to say that I have not lobbied on some very tough issues because I did believe in them, but that they were controversial. Um, one issue that comes to mind, um, and I think Rob, I think you were involved in this. I can't remember. I know the hospital association was, but um, the whole issue of the Natural Death Act, which goes back in time to you know certain things about dying that are very, very strongly listed in statute. But there were way there were there was an effort to make them either a little bit more liberal, a little more clear. You're at that point and I'm not picking religions or sides on this, you have the religious community that may have a different view than the medical community. And it was, and, it, and it's a very personal issue to legislators and obviously to the public. And I really liked working on that issue because it was personal to people. And you, you found out how people really felt inside or what their life experiences were. Um, it, it, be, it was a very humanizing issue, but it also was, very difficult, very divisive, wasn't partisan as much as it was um, just human feelings that suddenly floor debate and lobbying was so emotional. Uh, you know, I think we ended up with a really good statute. It stood, it stood the test of time. Um, it was something I felt comfortable lobbying, but there were people who just simply couldn't lobby on it. And so I think that's a very roundabout way, David, of answering your question, but I don't know how anybody lobbies if they don't, don't pretty much agree with the issue. Okay, let's open this up. Um, take your mute off and raise your hand figuratively or physically, and we'll see who has a question. Nancy? Hi, yeah, um, Susie, I have a, a question. Um, you talked about we have lots of lobbyists, and I understand that. And if I'm interested, say, in my local independent bookstore or the library or the health club, it seems like I find out about issues when they're already way discussed way down the line. Is there a place to look at to see whether, right, I love parks, if, there, if there's discussions or things happening against what I'm feeling that should happen, how do I find out that before it's like on a ballot or before it's kind of too late? Well, the good news is that there's really two answers to that, or maybe three, Nancy. Um, first of all, if, if you go to a link that opens the world to everything in Olympia, it's ledge.wa.gov. So it's L-E-G dot W-A dot G-O-V. And there is a search function there. You can type in libraries. You can type you know, type in anything you want for a search. And it, over a period of years, can show you any bills, issues that came up dealing with that. I'm simplifying what's a very complicated website, but that is a simple way to get to it. Obviously, if you're interested in libraries, you can go to your local library and ask if there are any. But I, the legislature meets um, one year, 60 days, and one year, 105 days. And, and the 105 day session, nothing goes quickly. Matter of fact, 105 days seems like 305 days. Um, but think, you know, I mean, if you if you're aware of the enough of the process and how 
how it gets through that 105 days, nothing should catch you by surprise. I also think that it's very important now that, again, we have, a, I think, a great Secretary of State's office that puts out a lot of information prior to elections. Um, but at that point, I think you're right, Nancy, suddenly you have to vote in that particular, uh, on that particular issue. But I think for some issues, like you said, libraries or parks, you know, those are, those are more likely to be tax issues and local government issues than state issues. Um, but I, I think that just being part of your local community, whether it's libraries or whatever your issues are, and, you know, following what they say in their, I mean, if you go to the library, there's little documents that are always around that say, oh, look at this. So, I mean, I think that's the best way, but the other way that I think is important is if you follow your local elected officials, each of the legislators has a website and um, emails that they send out periodically from their offices. They don't do it automatically. You have to request it, but it's easy to do by, you know, when Eileen Cody was a legislator, Eileen.Cody, every legislator is first name, dot, last name, and again, at the ledge.wa.gov. And you can ask to be on their mailing list and sometimes it's pretty shallow information because if getting into the weeds on a newsletter is not so, but you get an idea and you find out what that legislator's priorities are. Again, I'll use Eileen Cody since I've worked with her so many years and I miss her being there now, but um, it, you knew that almost everything Eileen dealt with would be healthcare in one way or another, but healthcare is a big category. So through her newsletters, you find out what her, what her priorities are. And I think the other thing is, associations, I mean, state library association, picking on libraries again, but, you know, they have newsletters too. And, and all of that should be information that comes out pretty quickly um, before it's really considered by the legislature. Those are a couple ideas. Great. Thank you. Thanks for the question. Who's next? Come um, on, you guys. <laughs> I'll say uh, Do Donna's put a uh... Uh, Donna says, I hope you'll say more about party loyalty being stronger than issues and how you've been frustrated by that lately when solutions shouldn't be partisan. Okay. This is a tough one. And I obviously have picked sides here. My tough issue this session was a proposal by optometrists who are not medical doctors wanting to do surgery obviously ophthalmologists do surgery. So that's pretty simple on the outside. Somebody wants to be surgeons, ophthalmologists don't think that they're trained adequately. And I could spend the next five hours telling you why that's good, bad, whatever the arguments are. But I, I and probably both sides have been very frustrated because I know how to simplify this and I'm totally in the weeds. Optometrists are more active in their communities um, they are on golf teams, they go to Rotary, they're active, they're just active more, much more than medical doctors are. And this is true on any medical issue. Doctors just are not big participants in their, in their community efforts. So all of a sudden you have these two contentious issues. Um, I would say that science should dictate an answer to that. Um, how many hours of training, you know, have they been done on real people or synthetic eyes? All these issues that go back and forth. And obviously I was representing the ophthalmologist. We opposed this bill. You can agree with that or not. That's not important to this discussion. But at the end of the day, this bill is on the governor's, on the governor's desk for action now. And through 98% of that process, science was not what dictated the bill passing. Uh, matter of fact, it was basically ignored. And I know I'm prejudiced, please accept that. But, you know, oh, well, my, my local optometrist says it's, it's okay. I haven't heard from my ophthalmologist in my district. What's an ophthalmologist? I mean, it, it's very frustrating. And I'm using that example because it's close to home, it's recent, but it really applies to so many other issues that are particularly medical issues. And I think you could also, say somewhat the same on environmental issues, although those don't hit your heart the way some medical issues do. It's really hard to get science, um, particularly science, to, to be recognized as more than a political issue. That's a big generalization. I'm sorry to do that. Um, 
the poison center was an issue that Rob and I worked on. It, I, I mean, no one should disagree that we needed a poison center that was funded and could instantly respond. But gee, we don't have any data out of it. Um, let's not fund it right now. Let's see what happens. Crazy answer in our view. So we had to fight for why the poison center should be funded, even though we could show you how many lives it had been, you know, had been saved, but we couldn't break it down into data categories. So it's really, you know, for those of us, most of my clients are medical in one way or another. And to break that down into science versus partisan versus politics can be very frustrating, very hard, very worth it. <laughs> um, Mary Code had a question. I'll mute, Mary. There you go. I was wondering um, just how the legislators view you. Is it a collegial relationship? Do you feel like you're trying to get your foot into a closed door? I mean, how it seems like a hard job to me. And I just wondered how how you deal with that <laughs> or if it's easy. A great question. Um, I would say it is hard. I mean, I think that I use the word relationships. I think Rob used that word. It is the basis of everything we do. I mean, in our real lives, in our work lives, political lives, um, you know, just like your real life, you know, some people are going to be drawn to you and some are not. I mean, I've made some, I think, awesome friends of legislators. And some of them I respect deeply, even when I may disagree with them personally or for my clients. Some of them are just wonderful, wonderful human beings. And some of them are just plain jerks. Sorry. I mean, we probably wouldn't agree on which was which in that case, but I have to work with them all. I mean, I, I, I try, I think in all my years, I can list four legislators that I really was enemies with that. They just plain didn't like me, didn't agree with me, didn't like how I presented information, which is fair. I mean, I might've been at fault there. Um, but I mean, there are, some people are easier to like in real life and some people are easier to like politically. Um, I, I think there's another word that Rob used that's just so important. And I'm gonna throw that optometry issue right back at you and, um, and not even feel sorry for it, is honesty. I, I mean, I, I think that, I think everyone in Olympia, even the people who may not love me, know that I'm honest. I mean, what you see is what you get, a piece of paper. If I hand you a piece of paper with information, that information is gonna be so vetted that you can't find, you, you may not agree with it, but you can't dispute it, its accuracy. So, I mean, and we say, gee, if you tell a lie in Olympia, you're gonna pay for it later. Mm -hmm. I think maybe in Rob's in my early days there, that was true. It is not true now. There, I'm, I'm not saying that most of the lobbyists or legislators lie. I don't think they set out to do that uh, on, on my favorite, not favorite issue this session on optometry. There was a lot of misinformation. And, you know, we just said, I can't go around and tell legislators, oh, that person lied. I mean, that's kind of not the greatest way to communicate. But there's a lot of ways of saying, well, that's a, that's a mistruth there. And you make enemies when you do that. I mean, it's, um, but I like, I mean, I'm willing to like almost all the legislators. I, they're, they have to work hard to get there. Um, most of them try really hard. Most of them are pretty nice people. Um, and, you know, maybe an example of how important that is, um, for the, well, not during COVID, but I, since I live in Olympia, it's easier for me to, to entertain. I don't, you know, I don't do much whining and dining. I've never done a lot of that. But every year I've had a dinner at my house and it's been often the chair of the healthcare committee. And anyway, it doesn't, but it's partisan. I make you know, one, two legislators, one from each party, and they get to pick the three people from each of their parties for a very, very nice catered dinner. So this kind of, hmm, we want to be at Susie's dinner. But I, I mean, they're my favorite event of the year because they're forced to be in a small dining room they may disagree on everything and they laugh and laugh and 
they're they suddenly become human beings so i i spent a lot of time trying to put people together i mean maybe not as formally as that but you know i need them all i i and if i have a thing to be proud of leaving finally retiring it's a for a long time, the Republicans thought I was a Republican and the Democrats thought I was a Democrat. <laughs> and I mean, I'm really proud of that because I, it, you know, healthcare shouldn't be partisan. <laughs> and most of what I've done is healthcare. So, um, yeah. who else has a question? So while, I, we wait, while we wait a minute for a question, I just want to make sure y'all, you know, if you, if you click on the chat, if you haven't, I just want to note that. Um, Cynthia's lifted up some good comments and um, Irene was really helpful in putting some of the websites up just so you'd have those there as well. I don't know if Cynthia wants to speak to her comments or um, Irene wants to amplify those uh, sites, but I just want to make sure all of you, you know, take a look at those. Cynthia, I want to comment on the advisory ballots. I mean, it, I certainly not going to, I'm not paid to have a position on it. And I'm, but the sheer fact that they cost a lot of money to do was very, was part of those advisory ballots being voted away. It's, you know, waste of money without any meaning. But those people who really loved the discussion of those advisory ballots, it's very interesting. I, I didn't even know that was going to be an issue this year. And it was really interesting to hear it. So appreciate your opinion on that. So I'll just add that I do lobby for the League of Women Voters and have done for um, about 10 years now. And one of our key issues the last couple of years has been to try and get those off the ballot, partly because of the money, but more importantly, because they don't have any meaning. And what happens is people don't vote the rest of the ballot because they get so bogged down in those. Hmm. So we finally were able to get that off and are very pleased about that. I think it it really does change our democracy. It makes the real um, ballot more significant. So anyway, but uh, I wanna thank you both for your comments today. It was very um, helpful, very interesting. And I wanna say that I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you for all the work that you've done in Olympia. So I'd like to point out uh, that legislators on a, any given day might be asked to vote on fisheries, K through 12 education, uh, prison reform, uh, licensing requirements. And there's no way that the normal legislator is gonna be well-informed on every one of those topics that they're gonna be asked to vote on. Now, once in a while, there's a legislator who thinks they know the, all the information about every topic but they usually don't. That's where lobbyists can come in to be very helpful, to provide the information and the facts. There could be lobbyists on one side of the issue and lobbyists on the other side of an issue, but they're providing facts that inform the legislator before they make a decision about whether to sponsor a piece of legislation or whether to vote for a piece of legislation or not. Um, That's where that honesty comes in. I, I do have one anecdote about honesty. Uh, I don't remember the guy's name and he's dead now, probably 15 years, but maybe 25 years ago, we came out of a hearing uh, and Perry Keithley, who was one of our associates, uh, who, who was known for his straight lace honesty, was impressed by the testimony that this person gave in front of the committee and had statistics to support his argument. And Perry asked the guy, where did you get those statistics? Man, that was fabulous. And the guy said, I just made it up. They never check. I heard that one time. And that was from just one individual. And from that point on, we didn't really trust that guy for anything. So unless there are no, uh, no more questions, uh, I'm going to draw this to an end. Um, for those of you who participated Actually, um, in one, two, or three of these sessions. Rob? Rob? Yes. Hi, it's Irene. Um, since there are a few minutes and most of you are affiliated with Fauntleroy Church, can I just give a little anecdote too? And I'm, I hope my sister Cynthia will um, forgive me for this. It's not about her, but about our dad. 
Um, our dad, Lou Stewart, was a lobbyist for 15 years or so for the Washington State AFL-CIO and um, very active um, in Olympia. And he was the education director, but lobbied about half the year. Um, back in the, this is a Fauntleroy Church connection, back in the late 60s and throughout the, most of the 70s, we had a state legislator in the 34th district named Bill Leckenby. And Bill Leckenby was a Republican and uh, the owner of Leckenby Steel, um, worked with um, Ben Weeks. A lot of people know, know, know the Weeks family. Um, and my dad was a Democrat and worked for organized labor. He got an invitation to brunch one day at, oh, and Bill Luckenby was not only a Fauntleroy Church member, he was ma married to um, Betty Yarrow, um, Susan Yarrow Morris's mother. And Susan was a, what, associate pastor? But uh, Karen, I can't quite remember, yeah. but I think you know her. So anyway, my dad got an invitation to brunch at their home in Fauntleroy and um, went to the brunch and he went in and everyone except for Bill and Betty were lobbyists. And he said it was the strangest gathering of lobbyists he had ever seen. None of that, it just didn't make any sense to him. And um, anyway, they sat down and Bill said, you're probably wondering why I called you all here <laughs> and, and said, I come home from Olympia and I tell my wife, Betty, every day who was helpful to me, who I could trust, who made a difference in my life, who made my life easier as a legislator and that sort of thing. And she said, I want you to make a list and invite them all to brunch. And so <laughs> my dad was one of them. And he said he never did mention it to any other um, lobbyists, including the people he worked with, because it was a little embarrassing. But <laughs> that was a perception that was was out there. There are lobbyists who can, you know, who are just known to be trustful. Um, they know their stuff. You you know, they they help you get your job done. They make your life better as a legislator. And I, I just wanted to share that because it's a very kind of an odd Fauntleroy Church connection from way back. <laughs> I lived in Olympia at the time, so you know, <laughs> I wanted to share that. And Cynthia, I see your heart. Great story. Great story. All right, um, I'm going to wrap up this. Um, I hope that you have uh, three takeaways from these uh, three sessions that we've done. The first is that all mail voting is secure. There's going to be strident comments made that you have heard and will hear that all mail voting is fraudulent. And I think I can confidently say that based on what we know about King County and Washington State, it is not, at least in this state. And if the other state legislatures would just come to our state and see how it's done, that cry of fraudulence would just be history. Uh, the second thing is that we learned from uh, Representative Cody that laws are made thoughtfully and collaboratively most of the time. Uh, there are led pieces of legislation that pass um, because a majority just insists on it. But she said that most of the time this bipartisan or, or piece of legislation is not going to pass. The third thing is to sort of paraphrase what Susie was saying. Uh, you can vote. Uh, you can advocate. You can help campaign. Uh, you do have a voice in what happens uh, in Olympia. And to use a Fauntleroy example to end here, the Martinez family, two years in a row now, has had anti-hazing legislation passed that I think is very important. Um, they didn't have a lobbyist. They did it because the issue was important and because of the, they were on the right side of, of this issue. And the last piece of legislation, which is supposed to be signed by the governor on Tuesday, passed every committee, both houses, with not one negative vote. So that's an example, people that we know, that proves that we're all capable of being involved and influencing what happens in the legislature. So thank you for participating. It's been fun, and I think we all learned a lot. I wanna thank, thank you, you Rob. Rob. I, it, it's just, 
you've just your connection to just some exquisite hosts has been phenomenal and in the information as well so it's been good every afternoon to be in this gathered way so thank you rob i'm i'm glad i'm glad uh uh leah threw the question back at you so we could have this this kind of um, result from that. So thanks for everything, and thank you, Susie. Thank um, you. It, it was a it was a joy to listen to you. I think you could have talked all day, and I would have enjoyed every minute. Unfortunately, yeah. yeah it, I would have loved I would have loved another hour with you. Thanks so much. Call so. me anytime. Thanks a lot. Thank fun. you. Thank Bye. you. Bye. Bye. Bye, everyone.